it can't hurt now, was Sherlock Holmes's comment when, for the tenth time in as many years, I asked his leave to reveal the following narrative. So it was that at last I obtained permission to put on record what was, in some ways, the supreme moment of my friend's career. Both Holmes and I had a weakness for the Turkish bath. It was over a smoke in the pleasant lassitude of the drying room that I have found him less reticent and more human than anywhere else. On the upper floor of the Northumberland Avenue establishment, there is an isolated corner where two couches lie side by side, and it was on these that we lay upon September 3rd, 1902, the day when my narrative begins. I had asked him whether anything was stirring, and for answer he had shot his long, thin, nervous arm out of the sheets which enveloped him and had drawn an envelope from the inside pocket of the coat which hung beside him. It may be some fussy, self-important fool. It may be a matter of life or death, said he, as he handed me the note. I know no more than this message tells me. It was from the Carlton Club, and dated the evening before. This is what I read. Sir James Damery presents his compliments to Mr. Sherlock Holmes, and will call upon him at 4.30 tomorrow. Sir James begs to say that the matter upon which he desires to consult Mr. Holmes is very delicate, and also very important. He trusts, therefore, that Mr. Holmes will make every effort to grant this interview, and that he will confirm it over the telephone to the Carlton Club. I need not say that I have confirmed it, Watson, said Holmes, as I returned the paper. Do you know anything of this man, Damery? Only that this man is a household word in society. Well, I can tell you a little more than that. He has rather a reputation for arranging delicate matters which are to be kept out of the papers. You may remember his negotiations with Sir George Lewis, over the Hammerford Will case. He is a man of the world, with a natural turn for diplomacy. I am bound, therefore, to hope that it is not a false scent, and that he has some real need for our assistance. Our? Well, if you will be so good, Watson. I shall be honoured. Then you have the hour. 4.30. Until then... We can put the matter out of our heads. I was living in my own rooms in Queen Anne Street at the time. But I was round at Baker Street before the time named. Sharp to the half hour, Colonel Sir James Damery was announced. It is hardly necessary to describe him. For many will remember that large, bluff, honest personality, that broad, clean-shaven face, and, above all, that pleasant, mellow voice. Frankness shone from his grey Irish eyes, and good humour played round his mobile, smiling lips. His loosened top hat, his dark frock coat, indeed, every detail, from the pearl pin in the black satin cravat to the lavender spats over the varnished shoes, spoke of the meticulous care in dress for which he was famous. The big, masterful aristocrat dominated the little room. Of course, I was prepared to find Dr. Watson, he remarked with a courteous bow. His collaboration may be very necessary, for we are dealing on this occasion, Mr. Holmes, with a man to whom violence is familiar and who will, literally, stick at nothing. I should say that there is no more dangerous man in Europe. I have had several opponents to whom that flattering term has been applied, said Holmes with a smile. Don't you smoke? Then you will excuse me if I light my pipe. If your man is more dangerous than the late Professor Moriarty, 
or than the living Colonel Sebastian Moran. Then he is indeed worth meeting. May I ask his name? Have you ever heard of Baron Gruner? You mean the Austrian murderer? Colonel Damery threw up his kid-gloved hands with a laugh. There is no getting past you, Mr. Holmes. Wonderful. So you have already sized him up as a murderer? It is my business to follow the details of continental crime. Who could possibly have read what happened at Prague and have any doubts as to the man's guilt? It was a purely technical legal point, and the suspicious death of a witness that saved him. I am as sure that he killed his wife when the so-called accident happened in the Splugen Pass as if I had seen him do it. I knew also that he had come to England and had a presentiment that sooner or later he would find me some work to do. Well, what has Baron Gruner been up to? I presume it is not this old tragedy which has come up again. No, it is more serious than that. To revenge crime is important, but to prevent it is more so. It is a terrible thing, Mr. Holmes, to see a dreadful event. An atrocious situation preparing itself before your eyes to clearly understand whither it will lead and yet to be utterly unable to avert it. Can a human being be placed in a more trying position? Perhaps not. Then you will sympathise with the client in whose interests I am acting. I did not understand that you were merely an intermediary. Who is the principal? Mr. Holmes, I must beg you not to press that question. It is important that I should be able to assure him that his honoured name has been in no way dragged into the matter. His motives are, to the last degree, honourable and chivalrous, but he prefers to remain unknown. I need not say that your fees will be assured and that you will be given a perfectly free hand. Surely the actual name of your client is immaterial. I am sorry said Holmes. I am accustomed to have mystery at one end of my cases, but to have it at both ends is too confusing. I fear, Sir James, that I must decline to act. Our visitor was greatly disturbed. His large sensitive face was darkened with emotion and disappointment. You hardly realise the effect of your own action, Mr. Holmes, said he. You place me in a most serious dilemma, for I am perfectly certain that you would be proud to take over the case if I could give you the facts. And yet a promise forbids me from revealing them all. May I at least lay all that I can before you? By all means, so long as it is understood that I commit myself to nothing that is understood. In the first place, you have no doubt heard of General de Merville. De Merville? Of Khyber fame? Yes, I have heard of him. He has a daughter, Violet de Merville, young, rich, beautiful, accomplished, a wonder woman in every way. It is this daughter, this lovely, innocent girl, whom we are endeavouring to save from the clutches of a fiend. Baron Gruner has some hold over her, then? The strongest of all holds, where a woman is concerned, the hold of love. The fellow is, as you may have heard, extraordinarily handsome, with a most fascinating manner, a gentle voice, and that air of romance and mystery, which means so much to a woman. He is said to have the whole sex at his mercy, and to have made ample use of the fact. But how came such a man to meet a lady of the standing of Miss Violet de Merville? It was on a Mediterranean yachting voyage. The company, though select, paid their own passages. 
No doubt the promoters hardly realised the Baron's true character until it was too late. She absolutely accepts his version and will listen to no other. Dear me, but surely you have inadvertently let out the name of your client. It is no doubt General de Merville. Our visitor fidgeted in his chair. I could deceive you by saying so, Mr. Holmes, but it would not be true. De Merville is a broken man. The strong soldier has been utterly demoralised by this incident. He has lost the nerve which never failed him on the battlefield and has become a weak, doddering old man, utterly incapable of contending with a brilliant, forceful rascal like this Austrian. My client, however, is an old friend, one who has known the general intimately for many years and taken a paternal interest in this young girl since she wore short frocks. He cannot see this tragedy consummated without some attempt to stop it. There is nothing in which Scotland Yard can act. It was his own suggestion that you should be called in, but it was, as I have said, on the express stipulation that he should not be personally involved in the matter. I have no doubt, Mr. Holmes. With your great powers, you could easily trace my client back through me but I must ask you as a point of honour to refrain from doing so and not to break in upon his incognito. Holmes gave a whimsical smile. I think I may safely promise that, said he. For a short time he played polo at Hurlingham, but then this Prague affair got noised about and he had to leave. He collects books and pictures, he is a man with a considerable artistic side to his nature. He is, I believe, a recognised authority upon Chinese pottery and has written a book upon the subject. A complex mind, said Holmes. All great criminals have that. My old friend Charlie Peace was a violin virtuoso. Wainwright was no mean artist. I could quote many more. Well, Sir James, you will inform your client that I am turning my mind upon Baron Gruner. I can say no more. I have some sources of information of my own, and I dare say we may find some means of opening the matter up. When our visitor had left us, Holmes sat so long in deep thought that it seemed to me that he had forgotten my presence. At last, however, he came briskly back to earth. Well, Watson, any views? he asked. I should think you had better see the young lady herself. My dear Watson, if her poor old broken father cannot move her, how shall I, a stranger, prevail? And yet there is something in the suggestion, if all else fails, but I think we must begin from a different angle. I rather fancy that Shinwell Johnson might be a help. I have not had occasion to mention Shinwell Johnson in these memoirs, because I have seldom drawn my cases from the latter phases of my friend's career. During the first years of the century, he became a valuable assistant. But if the lady will not accept what is already known, why should any fresh discovery of yours turn her from her purpose? Who knows, Watson? Woman's heart and mind are insoluble puzzles to the male. Murder might be condoned or explained, and yet some smaller offence might rankle. Baron Gruner remarked to me. He remarked to you. Oh, to be sure. I had not told you of my plans. Well, Watson, I love to come to close grips with my man. I like to meet him eye to eye and read for myself the stuff that he is made of. When I had given Johnson his instructions, I took a cab out to Kingston and found the Baron in a most affable mood. Did he recognise you? There was no difficulty about that, for I simply sent in my card. He is an excellent antagonist, cool as ice silky voiced and soothing as one of your fashionable consultants, and poisonous as a cobra. 
He has breeding in him, a real aristocrat of crime, with a superficial suggestion of afternoon tea and all the cruelty of the grave behind it. Yes, I am glad to have had my attention called to Baron Adalbert Gruner. You say he was affable, a purring cat who thinks he sees prospective mice. Some people's affability is more deadly than the violence of coarser souls. His greeting was characteristic. I rather thought I should see you sooner or later, Mr. Holmes, said he. You have been engaged, no doubt, by General de Merville to endeavour to stop my marriage with his daughter Violet. That is so, is it not? I acquiesced. My dear man, said he, you will only ruin your own well-deserved reputation. It is not a case in which you can possibly succeed. You will have barren work, to say nothing of incurring some danger. Let me very strongly advise you to draw off at once. It is curious, I answered, but that was the very advice which I had intended to give you. Well, you will see how it works. For a man of personality can use hypnotism without any vulgar passes or tomfoolery. So she is ready for you, and I have no doubt would give you an appointment, for she is quite amenable to her father's will, save only in the one little matter. Well, Watson, there seemed to be no more to say so I took my leave with as much cold dignity as I could summon. But as I had my hand on the door handle, he stopped me. By the way, Mr. Holmes, said he, did you know Le Brun, the French agent? Yes, said I. Do you know what befell him? I heard that he was beaten by some Apaches in the Montmartre district and crippled for life. Quite true, Mr. Holmes. By a curious coincidence, he had been inquiring into my affairs only a week before. Don't do it, Mr. Holmes. It's not a lucky thing to do. Several have found that out. My last word to you is, go your own way and let me go mine. Goodbye. So there you are, Watson. You are up to date now. The fellow seems dangerous, mighty dangerous. I disregard the blusterer. But this is the sort of man who says rather less than he means. Must you interfere? Does it really matter if he marries the girl? Considering that he undoubtedly murdered his last wife, I should say it mattered very much. Besides, the client. Well, well, we need not discuss that. When you have finished your coffee, you had best come home with me, for the blithe Shinwell will be there with his report. We found him, sure enough, a huge, coarse, red-faced, scorbutic man, with a pair of vivid black eyes, which were the only external sign of the very cunning mind within. Well, surely you know enough about this devil to prevent any decent girl in her senses wanting to be in the same parish with him. She is not in her senses. She is madly in love. She has been told all about him. She cares nothing. Told about the murder? Yes. My lord, she must have a nerve. She puts them all down as slanders. Couldn't you lay proofs before her silly eyes? Well, can you help us do so? Ain't I a proof myself? If I stood before her and told her how he used me, would you do this? Would I? Would I not? Well, it might be worth trying. But he has told her most of his sins and had pardon from her, and I understand she will not reopen the question. I'll lay he didn't tell her all, said Miss Winter. I caught a glimpse of one or two murders besides the one that made such a fuss. 
He would speak of someone in his velvet way and then look at me with a steady eye and say, he died within a month. It wasn't hot air either, but I took little notice. You see, I loved him myself at that time. Whatever he did went with me, same as with this poor fool. There was just one thing that shook me. Yes, by cripes, if it had not been for his poisonous lying tongue that explains and soothes, I'd have left him that very night. It's a book, he has. A brown leather book with a lock and his arms in gold on the outside. I think he was a bit drunk that night, or he would not have shown it to me. What was it then? I tell you, Mr. Holmes, this man collects women and takes a pride in his collection, as some men collect moths or butterflies. He had it all in that book. Snapshot photographs, names, details, everything about them. It was a beastly book, a book no man, even if he had come from the gutter, could have put together. But it was Adelbert Gruner's book all the same. Souls I have ruined. He could have put that on the outside if he had been so minded. However, that's neither here nor there, for the book would not serve you, and if it would, you can't get it. Then he told the story, which I would repeat in this way. His hard, dry statement needs some little editing to soften it into the terms of real life. There was no difficulty at all about the appointment, said Holmes. For the girl glories in showing abject filial obedience in all secondary things, in an attempt to atone for her flagrant breach of it in her engagement. The general phoned that all was ready, and the fiery Miss W. turned up according to schedule. So that at half-past five a cab deposited us outside 104 Barclay Square, where the old soldier resides. One of those awful grey London castles which would make a church seem frivolous. A footman showed us into a great yellow curtained drawing room, and there was the lady awaiting us, demure, pale, self-contained, as inflexible and remote as a snow image on a mountain. I don't quite know how to make her clear to you, Watson. Perhaps you may meet her before we are through, and you can use your own gift of words. She is beautiful, but with the ethereal otherworld beauty of some fanatic whose thoughts are set on high. I have seen such faces in the pictures of the old masters of the Middle Ages. How a beast man could have laid his vile paws upon such a being of the beyond, I cannot imagine. You may have noticed how extremes call to each other, the spiritual to the animal, the caveman to the angel. You never saw a worse case than this. She knew what we had come for, of course. That villain had lost no time in poisoning her mind against us. Miss Winter's advent rather amazed her, I think, but she waved us into our respective chairs like a reverend abbess, receiving two rather leprous mendicants. If your head is inclined to swell, my dear Watson, take a course of Miss Violet de Merville. Well, sir said she in a voice like the wind from an iceberg. Your name is familiar to me. You have called, as I understand, to malign my fiancé, Baron Gruner. I am not clear. Here she turned her eyes upon my companion, who this young lady may be. I was about to answer when the girl broke in like a whirlwind. If ever you saw flame and ice face to face, it was those two women. I'll tell you who I am, she cried, springing out of her chair, her mouth all twisted with passion. I am his last mistress. 
I am one of a hundred that he has tempted and used and ruined and thrown into the refuse heap, as he will you also. Your refuse heap is more likely to be a grave. And maybe that's the best. I tell you, you foolish woman, if you marry this man, he'll be the death of you. It may be a broken heart, or it may be a broken neck, but he'll have you one way or the other. It's not out of love for you I'm speaking. I don't care a tinker's curse whether you live or die. It's out of hate for him, and to spite him, and to get back on him for what he did to me. But it's all the same, and you needn't look at me like that, my fine lady, for you may be lower than I am before you are through with it. I should prefer not to discuss such matters, said Mr. Merville coldly. Let me say once for all that I am aware of three passages in my fiancé's life in which he became entangled with designing women, and that I am assured of his hearty repentance for any evil that he may have done. Three passages, screamed my companion. You fool, you unutterable fool. Mr. Holmes, I beg that you will bring this interview to an end said the icy voice. I have obeyed my father's wish in seeing you, but I am not compelled to listen to the ravings of this person. With an oath, Miss Winter darted forward, and if I had not caught her wrist, she would have clutched this maddening woman by the hair. I dragged her towards the door, and was lucky to get her back into the cab without a public scene, for she was beside herself with rage. In a cold way, I felt pretty furious myself of Watson, for there was something indescribably annoying in the calm aloofness and supreme self-complacence of the woman whom we were trying to save. Several stitches have been necessary. Morphine has been injected, and quiet is essential, but an interview of a few minutes would not be absolutely forbidden. With this permission, I stole into the darkened room. The sufferer was wide awake, and I heard my name in a hoarse whisper. The blind was three-quarters down, but one ray of sunlight slanted through and struck the bandaged head of the injured man. A crimson patch had soaked through the white linen compress. I sat beside him and bent my head. All right, Watson, don't look so scared, he muttered in a very weak voice. It's not as bad as it seems. Thank God for that. I'm a bit of a single-stick expert, as you know. I took most of them on my guard. It was the second man that was too much for me. What can I do, Holmes? Of course, it was that damned fellow who set them on. I'll go and thrash the hide off him, if you give the word. Good old Watson. No, we can do nothing there unless the police lay their hands on the men. But their getaway had been well prepared. We may be sure of that. Wait a little, I have my plans. The first thing is to exaggerate my injuries. They'll come to you for news. There was a curious, secretive streak in the man which led to many dramatic effects, but left even his closest friend guessing as to what his exact plans might be. He pushed to an extreme the axiom that the only safe plotter was he who plotted alone. I was nearer him than anyone else, and yet I was always conscious of the gap between. On the seventh day, the stitches were taken out, in spite of which there was a report of erysipelas in the evening papers. The same evening papers had an announcement which I was bound, sick or well, to carry to my friend. It was simply that, among the passengers on the Cunard boat Ruritania, 
starting from Liverpool on Friday, was the Baron Adalbert Gruner, who had some important financial business to settle in the States before his impending wedding to Miss Violet de Merville, only daughter of etc., etc. Holmes listened to the news with a cold, concentrated look upon his pale face, which told me that it hit him hard. Friday, he cried. Only three clear days. I believe the rascal wants to put himself out of danger's way. But he won't, Watson. By the Lord Harry, he won't. Now, Watson, I want you to do something for me. I am here to be used, Holmes. Well, then, spend the next twenty-four hours in an intensive study of Chinese pottery. He gave no explanations, and I asked for none. By long experience, I had learned the wisdom of obedience. But when I had left his room, I walked down Baker Street, revolving in my head how on earth I was to carry out so strange an order. Finally, I drove to the London Library in St. James's Square, put the matter to my friend Lomax, the sub-librarian, and departed to my rooms with a goodly volume under my arm. That is your name for the evening, Watson. You will call upon Baron Gruner. I know something of his habits, and at half-past eight he would probably be disengaged. The note will tell him in advance that you are about to call, and you will say that you are bringing him a specimen of an absolutely unique set of Ming China. You may as well be a medical man, since that is a part which you can play without duplicity. You are a collector. This set has come your way. You have heard of the Baron's interest in the subject, and you are not averse to selling at a price. What price? Well asked, Watson. You would certainly fall down badly if you did not know the value of your own wares. This saucer was got for me by Sir James, and comes, I understand, from the collection of his client. You will not exaggerate if you say that it could hardly be matched in the world. I could perhaps suggest that the set should be valued by an expert. Excellent, Watson. You scintillate today. Suggest Christie or Sotheby. Your delicacy prevents your putting a price for yourself. But if he won't see me, oh yes, he will see you. He has the collection mania in its most acute form, and especially on this subject, on which he is an acknowledged authority. Sit down, Watson, and I will dictate the letter. No answer needed. You will merely say that you are coming, and why. It was an admirable document, short, courteous, and stimulating to the curiosity of the connoisseur. A district messenger was duly dispatched with it. On the same evening, with the precious saucer in my hand and the card of Dr. Hill Barton in my pocket, I set off on my own adventure. The beautiful house and grounds indicated that Baron Gruner was, as Sir James had said, a man of considerable wealth. His features were regular and pleasing, save only his straight, thin-lipped mouth. If ever I saw a murderer's mouth, it was there. A cruel, hard gash in the face, compressed, inexorable, and terrible. He was ill-advised to train his moustache away from it, for it was nature's danger signal, set as a warning to his victims. His voice was engaging, and his manners perfect. In age, I should have put him a little over thirty, though his record afterwards showed that he was forty-two. Very fine, very fine indeed he said at last. And you say you have a set of six to correspond? What puzzles me is that I should not have heard of such magnificent specimens. I only know of one in England to match this, 
and it is certainly not likely to be in the market. Would it be indiscreet if I were to ask you, Dr. Hill Barton, how you obtained this? Does it really matter? I asked, with as careless an air as I could muster. You can see that the piece is genuine, and as to value... I am content to take an expert's valuation. Very mysterious, said he, with a quick, suspicious flash of his dark eyes. In dealing with objects of such value, one naturally wishes to know all about the transaction. That the piece is genuine is certain. I have no doubts at all about that, but suppose... I am bound to take every possibility into account that it should prove afterwards that you had no right to sell. I would guarantee you against any claim of the sort. That, of course, would open up the question as to what your guarantee was worth. My bankers would answer that, quite so. And yet, the whole transaction strikes me as rather unusual. You can do business or not, said I with indifference. What is the game? You are here as a spy. You are an emissary of Holmes. This is a trick that you are playing upon me. The fellow is dying, I hear, so he sends his tools to keep watch upon me. You've made your way in here without leave, and by God, you may find it harder to get out than to get in. He had sprung to his feet, and I stepped back, bracing myself for an attack, for the man was beside himself with rage. He may have suspected me from the first. Certainly this cross-examination had shown him the truth, but it was clear that I could not hope to deceive him. He dived his hand into a side drawer and rummaged furiously. Then something struck upon his ear, for he stood listening intently. Ah, he cried, ah, and dashed into the room behind him. Two steps took me to the open door, and my mind will ever carry a clear picture of the scene within. The window leading out to the garden was wide open. Beside it, looking like some terrible ghost, his head girt with bloody bandages, his face drawn and white, stood Sherlock Holmes. The next instant he was through the gap, and I heard the crash of his body among the laurel bushes outside. With a howl of rage, the master of the house rushed after him to the open window. And then it was done in an instant, and yet I clearly saw it, an arm, a woman's arm, shot out from among the leaves. They were blurred, discoloured, inhuman, terrible. In a few words, I explained exactly what had occurred, so far as the vitriol attack was concerned. Some had climbed through the window, and others had rushed out onto the lawn, but it was dark, and it had begun to rain. Between his screams, the victim raged and raved against the Avenger. It was that hellcat, Kitty Winter, he cried. Oh, the she-devil, she shall pay for it, she shall pay. Oh, God in heaven, this pain is more than I can bear. I bathed his face in oil, put cotton wadding on the raw surfaces, and administered a hypodermic of morphia. All suspicion of me had passed from his mind in the presence of this shock. And he clung to my hands as if I might have the power even yet to clear those dead fish eyes which gazed up at me. I could have wept over the ruin had I not remembered very clearly the vile life which had led up to so hideous a change. It was loathsome to feel the pouring of his burning hands. 
and I was relieved when his family surgeon, closely followed by a specialist, came to relieve me of my charge. An inspector of police had also arrived, and to him I handed my real card. It would have been useless as well as foolish to do otherwise, for I was nearly as well known by sight at the yard as Holmes himself. Then I left that house of gloom and terror. Within an hour, I was at Baker Street. Holmes was seated in his familiar chair, looking very pale and exhausted. Apart from his injuries, even his iron nerves had been shocked by the events of the evening, and he listened with horror to my account of the Baron's transformation. The wages of sin, Watson, the wages of sin, said he. Sooner or later it will always come. God knows there was sin enough, he added, taking up a brown volume from the table. Therefore I gathered the girl up at the last moment. How could I guess what the little packet was that she carried so carefully under her cloak? I thought she had come altogether on my business, but it seems she had some of her own. He guessed I came from you. I feared he would. But you held him in play just long enough for me to get the book though not long enough for an unobserved escape. Ah, Sir James, I am very glad you have come. Our courtly friend had appeared in answer to a previous summons. He listened with the deepest attention of Holmes's account of what had occurred. You have done wonders, wonders, he cried, when he had heard the narrative. But if these injuries are as terrible as Dr. Watson describes, then surely our purpose of thwarting the marriage is sufficiently gained without the use of this horrible book. Holmes shook his head. Women of the de Merville type do not act like that. She would love him the more as a disfigured martyr, no, no, it is his moral side, not his physical, which we have to destroy. That book will bring her back to earth, and I know nothing else that could. It is in his own writing. She cannot get past it. Sir James carried away both it and the precious saucer. As I was myself overdue, I went down with him into the street. A brougham was waiting for him. He sprang in, gave a hurried order to the cockaded coachman, and drove swiftly away. He flung his overcoat half out of the window to cover the armorial bearings upon the panel. But I had seen them, in the glare of our fanlight, nonetheless. I gasped with surprise. Then I turned back and ascended the stair to Holmes's room. I have found out who our client is, I cried, bursting with my great news. Why, Holmes, it is, it is, a loyal friend and a chivalrous gentleman, said Holmes, holding up a restraining hand. Let that now and forever be enough for us. I do not know how the incriminating book was used. Sir James may have managed it, or, it is more probable, that so delicate a task was entrusted to the young lady's father. The effect, at any rate, was all that could be desired. Three days later appeared a paragraph in the Morning Post to say that the marriage between Baron Adalbert Gruner and Miss Violet de Merville would not take place. The same paper had the first police court hearing of the proceedings against Miss Kitty Winter on the grave charge of vitriol-throwing, 
such extenuating circumstances came out in the trial that the sentence, as will be remembered, was the lowest that was possible for such an offence. Sherlock Holmes was threatened with a prosecution for burglary. But when an object is good and a client is sufficiently illustrious, even the rigid British law becomes human and elastic. My friend has not yet stood in the dark. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.